Uh, Pennsylvania and indeed America has a very long history of saying they hate immigrants despite the fact that America is comprised 98% by immigrants. Irony? Maybe. Uh, very popular by the uh, right at the moment is to cite this quote by Theodore Roosevelt, who's president of the United States from 1901 to 1909. Uh, so there's a lot of memes on the internet. Here he is on Mount Rushmore, carved into Mount Rushmore. Do you know what Mount Rushmore is? And a mountain in some godforsaken place of the west where they had nothing better to do than to dynamite the faces of US presidents into the mountainside in some kind of bizarre hero worship. That's what people in the west are like. Uh, here he is, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, saw us through the Spanish-American War. Three days before his death, he sends this letter to the American Defense Society, uh, which is a little bit like the MP. Uh, but it's often cited in internet memes. It's given, it's given a the year of 1907 to put it in the middle of his presidency, but that's actually untrue. Actually, he became a lot more radical once he was freed up from the constraints of decent politics. Right? So he says here, uh, in the first place, we should, re we should insist that if an immigrant who comes here in good faith becomes an American and assimilates himself to us, he shall be treated on an exact equality with everyone else, for it is an outrage to discriminate against any such man because of creed or birthplace or origin. Actually, that sounds quite reasonable, doesn't it? Uh, and again, politicians, left, right, and center, quote this guy. Right? But there's another issue here, which is the issue of what today we call multiculturalism. Is multiculturalism a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, and Roosevelt was hard against multiculturalism. So he himself, being a descendant of immigrants, not surprisingly, he sees immigration as okay, but you know, within this certain context. You know, so you can't discriminate against the immigrant. But this right to be exempted from predication, excuse me, exempted from discrimination, is predicated among the man's becoming, in very fact, an American, and nothing but an American. There could be no divided allegiance here. Any man who says he is an American but something else also isn't an American at all. We have room for but one flag, the American flag, and this excludes the, this excludes the red flag, which symbolizes all wars against liberty and civilization. What rising superpower had the all red flag from 1917? Soviet Union, Soviet Union of course, this is an anti-communist statement. Just as much as it excludes any foreign flag of a nation to which we are hospital, we have hostile. We have room for but one language here, and that is English language, and we have room for but one sole loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people. This is, this is Donald Trump could be channeling this guy. Right? This is a lot. This is not like a, I think people like to look at Donald Trump and go, "Oh my God, he's the Antichrist!" Like, give me a break. He's typical, actually apart from the last eight years of kind of ultra-liberal left-wing politics in America, he actually is the norm to which most people in America grew up with, which is this. I can remember reading this in primary, not primary school, I think it was 12. I can remember reading this when I was 12 in school. Just a little bit of context for you there. A long history of anti-immigration. Anti-immigration typically is, you know, a bit silly because most people, because in America, and particularly America, is full of immigrants, right? Uh, so it's pretty outrageous. But there is this duality that America is both comprised of immigrants, but deep down tends to be anti immigration. Uh, this lecture is divided into some four bits here, they're pretty short. Uh, prologue, immigration to 1850, uh, the quote, huddled masses period, as we call it, the period of major European immigration uh, up to the end of World War I. Uh, African Americans, post-slavery, uh, migration from the South to the North, because of course uh, freed slaves in the South were subjected to all kinds of uh, uh, brutal repression from Southerners who didn't want slavery to end. There was a Northern military occupation of the South to force them to allow free slaves to vote, to force them to allow free slaves to have something approaching a normal life. And so a lot of people just gave up and moved to the North. Uh, you know, rather than stay and, and battle on. Uh, I think that's quite understandable. And then I'll touch on Now, the real prologue here is about German migration. 
Uh, this was the big concern right from the colonial period up until really nearly uh, the American Civil War. 1760, Pennsylvania had only about 183,000 people, with 10% of them in Philly. 183,000 people is less than live in Swansea, in an area the size of England. So it's not much, right? By 1800, it was 600,000. By 1900, it would be 9 million. So something pretty amazing happens in the middle there, amazing by, for, by, because of its scope. Ben Franklin, who are probably the most famous of all Pennsylvanians, who dies in 1790, one of the founding fathers of our nation and all this, uh, by then, by the time he died, 38% of Pennsylvanians were Germans. 38%. They were easily the biggest group uh, to come to Pennsylvania. About 30% to English and Welsh. So he sees his own kind of uh, uh, heritage, he fears being blotted out by a new German heritage. 22% are Scotch and Irish, and about 7% are uh, black, some are freed slaves, some are people who've come from the South uh, for a greater degree of liberty. Franklin was vociferously anti-German. Benjamin Franklin says, and I, I think Richard pointed this up to me, not being used to liberty, he says this to the Germans, not being used to liberty, they know not how to make mo a modest use of it. He calls them dissonant and disagreeable. He's really anti-German. He'd fit right in World War One. Uh, in the 2010 census, 25% of Pennsylvanians still identified their ethnicity as German. To still today. Now that includes, you'll find it's quite laughable, loads of people who happen to have a surname like Schultz. And so they've just grown up generationally being told our family came from Germany, our family came from Germany, our family came from Germany. My great-grandmother was born in Austria, you know. Uh, my dad grew up with a grandmother who could barely speak any English. It's typical. You know, it's the last wave of immigration prior to the borders closed with World War I. Uh, and so my dad would have had a right to an Austrian passport. Thus, it's, it sounds like a long time ago, but when you start thinking it generationally, most people have a grandparent who could have a European passport if they elected to follow that up. And so it still does have a sense of immediacy. One does wonder how many more generations before that perceived connection is gone, right? Anyway, 2010, a quarter of Pennsylvanians still identified as German American. Between 1800 and 1860, the population quadrupled in 60 years. So every 15 years, the population was going up by another 600,000. That's a phenomenal rate of increase. Uh, by 1860, there are 2.9 million people living in Pennsylvania when the Civil War happens. Germans continue to come, but Irish Catholics are a big new wave, particularly uh, following the uh, potato famine. By 1850, uh, Irish comprised more than 50% of foreign-born Pennsylvanians because they'd come in huge numbers, all pretty much in a lump, 1830s, 1840s. By 1860, there were 57,000 free blacks and ex-slaves. Uh, but keep in mind that the 1838 uh, Constitution had removed voting rights from blacks. I think part of this is as a consequence of the Dred Scott decision. Uh, Pennsylvania had always allowed all free persons under the Quaker ideal to vote, irrespective of ethnicity. But with the Dred Scott decision, the US Supreme Court influenced largely by Southern conservative, Southern, well, conservative Southern Democrats said that a uh, black press could never be a citizen of the United States, and so the Pennsylvania, state of Pennsylvania was forced to retract voting rights for blacks. And so, you know, this is not an all rosy story. Uh, this is still quite a dark story. Wave two comes in this period, 1850 to 1930, but the real watershed here is uh, after the Civil War, after 1865. You'll know, of course, that it, it says that the, this line from the Colossus by uh, Emerus Lazarus, which is written onto the, the Statue of Liberty, it says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, you need to be free. Well, Statue of Liberty is dedicated in 1886. It's a quote unquote gift from the French people, but actually that's a bit of a myth. The reality is over 12,000 people in France and an awful lot of them in America actually paid money into a public subscription to create this uh, piece of public statuary to monumental statuary, to have it founded, built it, made it a foundry in France, disassembled, shipped to America, to have a plinth built in New York City and have the 
Thank you so much. Ellis Island in New York handles 12 million European immigrants between 1892 and 1954, many of which went to Pennsylvania. Uh, it was not an entirely open door policy, contrary to what some say now in the press, bizarrely, uh, quite well known to academics, is the fact that if you were sick, if you were perceived to have cholera or TB or any other disease, a lot of which people caught on the ship on the way to New York, uh, then you're turned away and you're left on the ship where you probably don't have medical care until you eventually die, or you're on the ship and it goes back, which is a bit disappointing. Same thing happens to some disabled people, people not of sound mind, people with uh, what used to be called crassly mental retardation, uh, they're turned away. Philadelphia receives about 3.3 million directly from Europe. But there's a well-worn track from New York down to Pennsylvania. It's not that far. Uh, in fact, it's very close. And because of Pennsylvania's expanding industrial base, Pennsylvania is where more jobs were. There's certainly more jobs in New York than Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania population uh, hits uh, 3.5 million by 1870, so we got like uh, you know a million coming in in a decade, basically. 8.7 million by 1920. I mean, these are phenomenal increases in population base. There's more than twice as many people in 1920 than there were in 1870. 50 years, more than doubling. That's an unbelievable rate of population growth due to immigration. In 1900, there were 1.5 million foreign-born persons in Pennsylvania. The main groups, urban and the main groups, go to urban and industrial centers uh, because by the time we get to the 1880s, 1890s, all of the land that's suitable for cultivation, for the most part, is already being farmed by earlier waves of immigrants. Did I go back on a slide? Oh, no, I just had a kind of worry there. Uh, Italians, Poles, Slovaks, Russians, Lithuanians, Magyars, which we know as Hungarians today, of course, uh, Ukrainians, Greeks, and Ru Ruthenians. Ruthenians, that's an old word, it encompasses uh, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, all of those Slavic peoples who speak Russia as a, Russian as a first language, right? Or languages like modern Ukrainian, which is a artificially created derivation of Russia. Immigrant communities have separate churches. Uh, they, there's a long tradition of recruiting priests from quote unquote the old country uh, who have a better, who speak their own language and speak it better than they do if they're second or third generation. Uh, there are competing civic societies set up. In 1920, for example, Russians are the biggest single immigrant group in Philadelphia. Of course, they're Orthodox Christian, which is very different from the uh, Anglican Protestantism uh, or Quakerism of the first generations of uh, uh, settlers. Germans are the biggest group going to, Phil going to Pittsburgh, to the west of the state. Uh, in 1854, the uh, Teutonic Order the Teutonia uh, Manu Choir, which is the men's singing choir of Germans, is founded in Pittsburgh in 1835. Uh, the German singing choir is founded in Philadelphia. But it's slightly referred, it's, this one, the one in Pittsburgh is named in German and retains that name into the 20th century. Whereas the one in Philadelphia being a little bit more sensitive, perhaps, I don't know, at least it's named in English. Here's an old uh, flyer for it there, it says, uh, uh, 1871, I think that's meant to say there. Yeah? Uh, Poles and Italians, uh, if we look at Allegheny County, which is the area around Pittsburgh, say in a 20 mile radius around Pittsburgh, again, think of Pennsylvania as being divided between these two great urban centers, Philadelphia east of the mountains and Pittsburgh west of the mountains. Those counties around Pittsburgh where all this subsidiary industrial activity takes place is called Allegheny County named after the Allegheny River. And there, Poles and Italians uh, are nearly as many uh, in Allegheny County as there are Germans in the city itself. Uh, there's a district of Pittsburgh which continues even today to be called Polish Hill. Uh, and of course, World War, in World War I, street gangs formed, or excuse me, World, so try, let's try that again. World War II, street gangs formed between Poles living in Polish Hill and Germans living in Germantown on the other side of the river. And they would go back and forth and we were having a bizarre reenactment of World War II after the Germans invaded Poland happening in East Pittsburgh. Uh, 
There are about 15,000 Lithuanians who come to Pennsylvania, 30,000 of which all go to the same place, uh, which is a Schuylkill PA on the Schuylkill River. Uh, that tends to happen because of chain migration. Some people go, they send letters back, they say come here, more people go. Chain migration happens all the time. For example, there's a, a sizable Polish community in Port Talbot right now, almost all of whom are from Łódź. Because there was a guy, when there was a shortage of manual laborers in Port Talbot, when things were booming, uh, you know, back in 2006 or something, who had relatives in Wuj. He was in, uh, well, I'm not sure he's Welsh, English, but he was British first, but relatives in Wuj. So he, he literally organized a service where he'd drive a van to Wuj, recruit people, say, come with me back to Port Talbot. It's a sunny, beautiful place in the joyous and wealthy British Isles. And I will give you accommodation in a house for a few weeks, and I will help you get your NI number and do all of that type of stuff. And so now we have quite a sizable Polish community in Port Talbot, and they're all from Łódź. Nice. So it's a kind of microcosm of all of the, uh, of a connection between two places, Lithuania and uh, Skokiel, for example. Uh, this is just some of the uh, range of uh, ar architectural monuments that you find around Pittsburgh, for example. Uh, all of these different religions, which come with these di different peoples, all of course build their own cathedral. Here's St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a Catholic cathedral, finished in 1906. So it's the kind of colmization of 20 years of smaller buildings and fundraising by that religious community. Uh, the Old Anglican Cathedral, which is in the center of the city, now surrounded by skycrapers, not, not too far from Fort, Fort Pitt, of course, uh, it's Trinity Cathedral. Uh, Croatian Cathedral, Croatian Catholic Church here, was pulled down uh, about 1987, unfortunately. Uh, Pittsburgh was, after Zagreb, the city containing the most Croat speakers in the world, as of 1943, something like that. So Zagreb, biggest Croat city in the world. Number two, Pittsburgh. It's the same kind of like the Lithuanians. Uh, here's the old first congregational church, a beautiful building down in Pittsburgh, which became the Greek Orthodox Cathedral. You notice how they then climbed up there and carved St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church on the facade. You can't have those congregationalists who are kind of hardcore Protestants, uh, you know, leaving their mark there. Uh, immigrants go straight into the labor market. And I think I gave you a quote in a different lecture, actually, that's out of the Hugen Boom and Klein uh, History of Pennsylvania, which you find in the library, which says, uh, uh, the unfortunate thing is, it said, uh, when they did this thing called the Pittsburgh Survey, that's published in about six volumes, which basically tell how bad conditions are in Pittsburgh for immigrants, it says, the problem is because there's an infinite flow of cheap labor coming in, People will always work for less than the less than a reasonable rate and will suffer as a result. Uh, that's an argument that's been made uh, with reference, to a certain extent with reference to Brexit, but certainly an argument that's being made in the U.S. now with Hispanic immigration across the Mexican border is that uh, uh, whether you're pro or anti-immigration, everybody recognizes that those people who come in in large numbers have ultra bad living conditions and are paying ultra low wages. Uh, because there's an infinite supply and because they're technically not there legally, so you can pay them as little as you like. Uh, huge social policy to be worked out there, uh, which I won't come down on either side of that fence, certainly, certainly not in a classroom setting. But it's the same problem. Infinite supply of labor with no effective labor regulation, then because it didn't exist, now because that infinite supply of labor are people who are not there quote, quote, legally, uh, and so conditions are very, very poor. This leaves the major strikes, the Homestead Strike of 1892, the Anthem Strike Coal Strike in 1902, the Keys Rock Strike in 1909, the so-called Great Strike, which we'll talk about uh, lecture next week, of 1919. Coal and iron police used to be hired by private companies. Uh, Rent-a-cop is still the phrase used in common uh, Pennsylvania English. As a result uh, of the, their violent Tactics, the factory owners would just say, go out there with some batons and bust some heads. Uh, and as a, a reaction to that, uh, the Commonwealth agrees to establish the Pennsylvania State Police. Notice here, Pennsylvania State Police. State, 
established by the Commonwealth. A huge issue of contention at the time, shouldn't they be Commonwealth police? Because Pennsylvania is not a state, it's Commonwealth. But other states already had state police and state Pennsylvania was emulating New York and other states. And so they became called the Pennsylvania State Police, even though Pennsylvania is not a state, it is a Commonwealth. Uh, but, of course, there are so many uh, uh, Slavic persons living in Pennsylvania, the police end up, basically end up being bribed to go out and bust up riots and strikes, and so they become called the Pennsylvania Cossacks, and some people still call the PA State Police the Cossacks. Cossack, of course, are these uh, a kind of uh, semi-nomadic people who live in Russia, who get on board with communism and ride around and uh, bust heads on behalf of Lenin and Stalin. Uh, immigrants are seen as potential liability during World War I as they are from various national, hold various national sentiments. And again, I already mentioned the kind of Germans versus poor in street fights in World War II. African Americans post slavery, thousands of post slave African Americans come north looking for work. Uh, these are people who have been actively deprived in education of any kind by their owners, and so they do not have. Uh, do not have industrial skills. Certainly most of them do not, are not literate and they move into the lowest rung of manual labor. Uh, but they quickly get educated and begin to improve their condition. Uh, if we focus, they go to industrial towns and even today in Pennsylvania, if you're in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, there's a very large African American community. If you're anywhere in between, you can drive in a car for three hours and never see an African American person unless you're on a motorway. Or interstate, as we would call them. Uh, McKeesport, for example, there are 15 blacks in the census of 1880, 700 in 1900. Uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the black population doubles from 1890 to 1900 and increases another 25% between 1900 and 1910. Uh, African American laborers then are displaced by Slavic and Italian migrants because of the innate racism of factory owners and the innate racism of people coming from Europe who have not had contact with. Uh, people of other ethnicities, they're pushed out. 1905, 30%, 32% of blacks are in semi-skilled jobs in Steelton, PA. By 1915, that goes down to 26%, uh, and it drops even lower than that. There is, particularly after World War I, because there was a lot of commissioning of industrial work in World War I, after World War I, uh, industry slumps and when they have excess laborers, the first people they, they sack are African Americans. In Johnston in 1923, the mayor of Johnston courting favor with Western Pennsylvania's new Ku Klux Klan, which had been brought up from the south, drove more than 1,600 black steel workers and their families from the city and probably the mo in terms of race relations, the most single most shameful event in Pennsylvania. From World War I, uh, uh, World War I effectively ends European immigration. Post, the post-war Red Scare following the Russian Revolution uh, is led by a, the 1919 appointment to Attorney General of the United States, the fighting, the fighting Quaker, uh, Mitchell. What happened to his, oh, I can't check it there. I think his name actually has ended up under here, but it's, it's Mitchell is his name. Uh, U.S. Congress, 1909 to 1919, uh, he represents Pennsylvania in U.S. Congress, a bit like Penrose had, a key, he's a real maneuver. In 1919, uh, there are post-World War I riots and race riots. Again, uh, blacks are being pushed out of jobs when jobs become scarce, when industri industry uh, declines. On the 2nd of June, 1919, his, his home in Washington, D.C. is bombed. Here's a picture of it there. And so he kind of panics, and he, uh, there's a rising young star in the brand newly minted uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation named J. Edgar Hoover. He appoints Hoover to lead the investigation into this, who decides that it's the result of left-wing communists, uh, and Mitchell approves the deportation of 247 subversives and their families, and he also approves the so-called Palmer Raids, of which J. Edgar Hoover had a, fund, leading, a hand, leading to the 10,000 labor leaders being arrested across the country. Mitchell is a Democrat, and at this time, the Democratic Party nationally had abandoned its white supremacist platform and replaced it with an anti-immigrant platform. Again, it's hard to believe that today, the Democratic Party represents the other end of the spectrum, but 
we'll come back to that. That happens in 1960s. 1907 saw the highest U.S. immigration ever, 1.2 million. In 1921, we get the Emergency Quota Act that says, going forward, each year we will only take 3% as many immigrants from any one country as there were people from that country in, the, in America in 1910. 1924, the Immigration Act reduces that to 2% and focuses it on 1920. This ends the open borders policy. It ends the immigration to America as had been known up until that point. Most importantly, by pinning it against numbers of people from countries that were already in the US, it means new immigrants are linked to old immigrants in the sense that uh, there was a fear that there would be a lot of Southern Europeans and Jewish immigrants coming to America, but there aren't very many Southern Europeans or Jews here already. And so we can stop that by attaching the quotas to the current populations, which are largely German, English, uh, and Polish in particular. 1930s now, Immigration Nationality Act of 1965 ab abolishes the quota system. It allows a visa system where it says relatives of current U.S. citizens and residents, up to 23 in number, can be brought in. This leads to so-called chain, chain migration, where uh, uh, if you're a relative, you're called a special immigrant. Uh, the unintended, con unintended consequence of this is that because the vast number of immigrants coming into the U.S. after 1965 would be from Cuba and then from Mexico, particularly from Mexico and Ecuador and Panama where they come in illegally, but then when they have children, those children are Americans, and then the children can sponsor 23 of their relatives back in Panama or Ecuador or Mexico to come. But those people come and it's a kind of exponential uh, increase. And so that means that the vast majority of incoming immigration as an unintended consequence of the Immigration Nationality Act is actually for Central and South America, uh, which is why we have a huge Hispanic population in America now. Uh, by 1990, Pennsylvania had 11.8 million people, half a million of which were foreign born. The biggest group were 250,000 Hispanic persons. Uh, 137,000 Asian. When you see Asian in American context, that means Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, or Thai. Uh, Indian persons or Pakistani persons are just called Indian or Pakistani in American uh, English, typically. Uh, by t that always causes confusion. By 2010, the population reached 12.7 million, and I give you here the relative uh, uh, the uh, relative uh, numbers by. Uh, on the one hand, uh, by faith and by ethnicity. And you can get a sense of what Pennsylvania looks like today. So, right, that ended up taking the whole period. I've got 47 on my watch, but that says 51. Am I slow or is that fast? So I guess I could stop the recording there.